Welcome everyone and thank you for joining us for this Cambridge University Press webinar. My name is Rebecca Fletcher, a marketing executive with Cambridge University Press, and it's my pleasure to introduce Professors Gabor Bekesh and Gabor Kesdi to discuss their new textbook, Data Analysis for Business, Economics and Policy, publishing in May 2021. Just a few housekeeping points before we start. You have all joined in listen-only mode. However, you can submit questions throughout the event in the chat box. We encourage you all to do so, and Gabor and Gabor will answer as many as they can after their presentation. A recording of the event will be emailed to you afterwards, along with a link where you can find out more about data analysis for business, economics and policy, and request an examination copy. Gabor Bekesh is an assistant professor at the Department of Economics and Business of the Central European University and director of the Business Analytics Programme. And Gabor Kesdi is a research associate professor at the University of Michigan's Institute for Social Research. We hope that you enjoy this webinar. And without further ado, I will hand you over to our panelists. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for uh, for joining. I cannot see your face, but I hope uh, you'll have questions and we're going to get to know each other a little bit that way. So let me share my, I think my screen is shared, right? So uh, we're going to start with a 20 minute presentation uh, with a few slides. The slides are available at the website of our book and uh, also there's going to be a direct link to it so uh this is just a tweet from my more tech savvy co-author the other gabor gabor bakish a couple of days ago he tweeted a few landmarks uh, uh as uh, of our textbook development we first talked about this eight years ago about four years ago is when he shared a textbook uh, and, um, four years ago when, he, when we uh, signed a contract and it's been a long and uh, winding road but we enjoyed it and we hope that you're going to enjoy the end product of it. I think it makes sense to talk a little bit uh, about our personal motivation first because that might resonate with some of you uh, we taught a wide range of courses in a diverse set of students at various levels, BE, MA, PhD in economics and public policy, and a uh, set of programs, MS in finance, business analytics, MBA, as well as you know students visiting from other programs like uh, public health and, 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 and the rest. So we also uh, had the opportunity and the good luck to uh, uh, advise, mentor some of the students during their dissertation process or even during their process of writing uh, term papers in which they, actually, they had to do actual data analysis as opposed to just uh, uh, answering uh, homework questions or do homework exercises or, or answering exam questions. And when students started to do or work through their own uh, data analyses, the same issues kept coming up. And that was true for students at various levels of, of their studies, BME and PhD as well, very uh, different disciplines, and I must say different abilities, at least the way we kind of uh, uh, infer that from their course uh, performance, very similar issues kept coming up. And for some, there were holes in, in their knowledge of the process of data analysis. Actually, for most of them, there was holes, in, holes in, in very particular parts of the process itself. Uh, how to start working with data once they have it, you know, how to get data, how, what's, what's an outlier, and shall I think about outliers at all, at all and what's that? Um, how to merge the data data sets, how to structure the data. Uh, and there, other issue was not understanding their own data, not understanding what what their what uh, their methods do actually. They had a, a pretty good grasp over, over many many methods, but what they actually do was not always super clear. And very very um, uh, shockingly, or uh, uh, sometimes disturbingly, uh, many students were unable to interpret their own results. And then there's the usual problem with uh, papers. 
that we see from students, not every paper asks a question, and those that do ask, not, not all of them answer it. So we wanted to improve upon this, and, uh, and then we decided to write a book uh, in the end. Why? Because we thought that remedying these these uh, issues was of course possible and it is, it is of course possible through other means one-on-one -on -one mentoring is one of, is one of them uh, but we thought that if we had a textbook that incorporates most of all of most of these things that would be more efficient and many students would come with fewer or more um, better defined questions than they did and then mentoring could be saved for discussions that are less repetitive, uh, at least from, our, from the point of view of the instructor. So we decided in the end to write a book because we didn't find one that would include everything we wanted. What is it that we wanted? We wanted to teach the entire process of data analysis. Then we wanted to focus on the most important methods that work, not an encyclopedia of all methods, only few, but those that work. But those that, that we teach, we wanted them to understand very, very well uh, from why, why they work, how they work, and how to interpret the results. We wanted to have case studies that are similar to real world work. So instead of giving them a nice and tidy data set or work files in which they just have to uh, do an analysis that is maybe be just two lines of code, we wanted them to have an experience of working with real world data. We're gonna come back to that. We wanted to have an ecosystem of book data, code exercises and more. And uh, uh, we wanted to have something that can be adopted in many ways. And our reasons I believe are gonna be very uh, important for most of you as well. Uh, and here we're gonna go into the details. So first teach the entire process. Uh, we wanted uh, students to acquire working knowledge of the entire process of data analysis and a deep understanding of the methods that work. To that aim, our book covers multiple disciplines. Interest statistics, econometrics, data science, these are usually found in different books. We wanted to focus on the entire process, data wrangling, exploration, modeling, visualization, interpretation of results, all of them, not just modeling. We wanted to promote hands-on learning to that aim, one third of our text, one third of our text is case studies covering 26 data sets. And there are 120 data exercises on top of our case studies. Some of them are robustness checks or little variations on the case studies. Others are replications using similar data, but not the same data. And some are different. And we want to facilitate replication of all the results that are in the book in the form they are there, all tables and graphs. So we have the code to do all that. And we share that code. And also the code that gets students to clean data from raw data. So the code that cleans the raw data. And we're going to share that. We are sharing that as well. And we're sharing that in Stata, R, and Python as well. We're going to talk more about that later. Uh, we received some endorsements, and many endorsements, and we are immensely proud of them. And here's one that we're very proud of. Here's our one endorser, David Card, agrees that it's a great thing to, uh, uh, to cover the entire process, a path from data collection through modeling. And he also agrees that our textbook achieved that goal at least, at least to some extent. So here's a table of content. These are the topics that our textbook covers. There are four parts. And within each part, there are six chapters. Part one is data exploration, data collection and quality, data, data wrangling, exploratory data analysis, correlation and comparison, statistical inference and testing. So from all of this, statistical inference and testing are more traditional interest statistic parts. and uh, Expert data analysis and and that that also uh, contains uh, inter traditional interstatistics parts. But about half of this chapter is beyond what intro introductory statistics textbook usually uh, contain. The second part is 
a regression analysis that is close to traditional econometric course uh, uh, course topics starts from simple regression and with nonlinear patterns messy data including measurement error uh, generalization of regression results uh, then goes on to multiple regression and ends with uh, probability models and time series regressions part four is prediction predictive analytics uh, that is most often contained in books on statistical learning or machine learning. We start with the framework of prediction, including concepts and the, the process of cross-validation, for example. Then we move on to a variable selection in the regression context and lasso. And then we leave regressions for other, other methods, regression trees, then random forest, forest uh, boosting methods that actually work. And then uh, the last two chapters are about probability prediction, classification, and the last one is forecasting from time series. Forecasting from time series is often part of uh, econometric textbooks, rarely part, they are rarely part of, uh, of machine learning textbooks, but it's the same aim, prediction, so we treat it within the same unified framework. And the last part is causal analysis, and uh, that uh, uh, starts with a framework uh, that is mostly based on uh, potential outcomes. But we also talk about causal maps that were recently uh, popularized uh, these graphs. Uh, and then we go on uh, to discuss experiments. And the last four chapters of this part are causal analysis of uh, observational data. We start with regression matching and some, not much, but some on IV uh, instrumental variables and regression discontinuity design is a matter in cross-sectional settings as well. And then we move on to longitudinal data, first different dips, and then multi-period panel data. And we actually devote two chapters to panel data methods. Panel data methods in a broad sense, the very last chapter contains um, synthetic controls as well. So again, an endorsement of which we are very proud. Uh, Josh Angers from MIT. He thinks that we did a pretty good, pretty good job at covering what's needed. Yeah, sort of like that. And now back to now now to Gabor Bekesh, who's going to talk about case studies. Okay, thanks a lot, and uh, welcome everyone. So let me talk about other reasons we thought uh, we could we could contribute to uh, teaching data analysis. And um, we you know, strongly believe that uh, using case studies are important. And what we mean by this is not just using illustration studies, but using completely developed uh, projects and, and, and studies where we start with an actual question. And because the book covers topics from, from business policy and economics, you know, the, the, there is a variation of, of the question. But the idea is to build a complete standalone uh, study in each of the chapters where we start from a question then think about what kind of data we need to use um, start working with the raw data and importantly you know we acknowledge the messiness of real world data right so as as my colleague mentioned um, very often um, textbooks contain stories and, and case studies from academic papers where everything is really nice and and we focus here also on the messiness of data all the potential problems so we work on wrangling data wrangling and exploratory analysis to help uh, move uh, ahead to the actual analysis right and um, once we have results we spend quite a bit of time how to present those results to create decent graphs as you can see on the picture here um, we are not graphic designers, but we made an effort uh, to do decent, decent looking graphs and uh, the publisher was kind enough to let us do a, a book in color where these uh, graphs look, look good enough. And um, finally, we aim uh, to end case studies by answering the question. So we start with a question, answer the question, and in, in between we spend uh, time on how to get from one to the other. There is a variety of case studies and um, and let, let us just give um, some examples from each of the parts of the book that my colleague mentioned. So personally, I'm a big football or, or soccer fan, and so there will be some, some case studies about that. And we start, for example, with 
um, identif identifying successful football managers and that, oh, that for example allows us to think about entity resolutions, how to connect data sets uh, based on names. It allows us to think about how to define success, right? What is the question, how to get to the data and how to get an answer. Uh, we also work on price data here. One of the case studies is comparing online and offline prices across uh, different products and, and testing the difference. The statistics is very simple. However, it has a very strong policy relevance. One of the joys of this project was to work with people from the World Management Survey and we used their data set and developed a data set for public consumption where we can think about the quality of management and firm performance and, and firms starting with firm size but moving on other metrics. There are a bunch of case studies that are used international data. One is looking at life expectancy and average income of, of a country but we use for example uh, the success of vaccinations uh, 20, 30 years ago. We use microdata, uh, often scraped from the web. One example is looking uh, and working with hotel, hotel data uh, and, and, and showing how regression works and how to find a good, good deal. In terms of uh, machine learning, we use Airbnb data uh, to build a model that is able to well predict uh, prices. And when we think about um, the causal part, one example would be uh, working from home when we developed that case study that was five years ago and at that time it was kind of something interesting and and we didn't know how important uh, that that will become we also look at another case study where we uh, uh, look at uh, mergers and their effect on on prices and and i think one of the key aim that we had with case studies is to combine theory and practice to um, build up a theoretical knowledge and understanding of interpretation of various models and to combine them with real-world examples and, and the case studies serve, serve uh, to, to help that and, and also we try to pick case studies from different parts of life and you know have sports and food and, and uh, business decisions and economic questions and policy questions and to combine that together. Um, so the second point I want to talk about is that beyond writing a textbook, which was with 744 pages, that was quite uh, a bit of a work, we also try to build an ecosystem around it. And what I mean by ecosystem is basically creating uh, points of reference uh, to find everything that we have, to search through chapters and case studies and data set used. And, and, and this is our website, gabor'sdataanalysis.com. And this is the starting point, point for all the information. So you can just go there and you can move from there and find everything that, that you may need. We also give technical instructions how to set up folders and, and code settings uh, to run our code. And um, this is where you can find links to, to data and code. And, and finally, and, and, and pretty importantly, you can find resources. Right. This is the resource section is especially designed for instructors, for future teachers of our textbook, uh, where you can find resources about um, how to teach in different programs. And, and uh, this is an evolving part, right? We, we see our feedback and talk to people and, and add more ideas and suggestions. So the data uh, for all the case studies, um, both in a raw and in clean format are available from OSF.io. OSF is a fantastic website. It's an open uh, science foundation, um, a, a free website where you can store uh, data and papers and code as well. Uh, and this is where uh, we have our, our repositories and this is where all the data sets live. And, and we also uh, publish cleaning codes in, in this website and, and you can see a link here uh, to that. One of the main feet of this project is developing codes that reproduce all our case studies in three different coding language, Stata, R, and Python. The Python is not fully ready, but we are hoping it will be, it will be ready soon enough. And these codes will reproduce the, all the numbers, all the tables, all the graphs that are in the book. And that could be useful for students to, to uh, tweak with them and, and see what happens, but also to teach coding. All this code is available at our 
uh, GitHub repo, we are building um, releases. So uh, in every now that we find maybe bugs or we develop the code, you can see different releases and, and download them at once. And, and finally, there will be a lot of resources for instructors and that include uh, bits that are in the textbook, including practice questions, including data exercises, including derivations for more advanced study that are in appendices that we call under the hood. On our website, you can find uh, ideas and suggestions how to learn coding, how to set up uh, systems in, in, in different uh, code languages and additional resources. And the publisher website will include solutions to practice questions. There are 360 practice questions throughout our 24 chapters, and we have like a 100-page solution to that. Uh, we'll also publish slides and the teaching guide. And now back to my colleague to finish the talk. How to use this book, how you as instructors can use this book is what we want to uh, talk about in the last few minutes of our presentation. And um, first, I want to talk about the structure and then something about uh, 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 um, teaching methods. So this book and the surrounding ecosystem is designed to cover a full year's course. It's a complete package of data analysis course by four years. We mean we have 24 chapters in the book and a full academic year typically Go, uh, goes for 30 weeks, either two semesters or th two semesters or two or three three quarters semesters, whatever, or some other uh, breakup. Uh, and uh, the the uh, the the main aim is for master's level uh, or any other graduate level of teaching. We're going to tell why. Uh, but it's suited for undergraduate uh, teaching as well and individual learning as well. We're going to go back to that. So one, one way to adopt our book, as what we may call it one corner solution, is to implement it as it is. The other corner solution is to take only the case studies from our textbook and then augment your existing course, your existing teaching with the case studies. The benefit of that is that our case studies are real life case studies in the sense that they start from messy data, they ask actual questions, they actually an they answer actual questions and have everything in between. But also the uh, the use of three uh, coding languages in parallel, which is a uh, which is a great uh, uh, addition both to students but also instructors. And what the way I learned the little R I know is by translating data to our, to be more precise to uh, uh, to create the results in R using a very different logic, uh, and not only in Stata, in Python as well. So that's the other solution. And anything in between you can do. You can add new courses, you can replace some parts of your program using some chapters, other, other parts of your course or program might be based on other textbooks. I mean, you are the instructors, you know better what, what you think your students should learn, you know your students, but we'd like to give you a little more uh, help in, in adoption. Well, before we go, we go about, that, about the case studies, you do need a textbook for the case studies. The textbooks are, uh, textbook includes the, uh, the interpretation of the results and the questions and the, and the answers in, in more detail, although our uh, website has the sh a short description of the case studies. The book is really helpful to work with them. So where instructors can use our book, uh, this is, as the title suggests, mostly uh, economics, uh, public policy, business, uh, but other quantitative social sciences, finance, uh, and also other policy uh, oriented programs like uh, health policy or public health can, can use it. Our case studies cover a diverse set of uh, set of uh, topics, but there's there's business in there, there's finance in there, there's health policy in there, not just one particular topic. Uh, and the level could be uh, uh, applied masters is the main aim, but first years of research masters programs can use it. This book is 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 more applied in, in at least in the, that's the way econ, call, econ people call it, or more hands-on. It, it 
its approach and it has a data driven approach uh, instead of um, instead of a uh, an approach that builds from first principles from statistical principles such as uh, you know understanding data engineering processes and and likelihood principles and stuff like that you can use you can start a research program with that approach and then build on that uh, with a more traditional approach but it's a it's a decision you, you make however we, we we think we pretty strongly believe that in applied courses this is a better approach students appreciate this more uh, that's why we first listed the applied part and uh, the teaching environment this book is, is this book is suited for traditional classroom learning but also online and hybrid courses and individual learning we wanted to write a textbook that explains stuff so it's good for individual learning you can use it as a textbook in traditional classroom environment but less time spent on lecturing abstract things and more time spent on case studies in fact that's the way we prefer to teach it talk not much about the the content of a chapter in extra abstract instead uh, assign that in advance for reading and maybe have a Q&A or a short summary such section in the beginning of the lecture and then move on to the case study or, or two, one or two case studies that uh, that uh, show the content uh, in application so student requirements we require little mathematics and and not much not much formal statistical background either but the reason we think this is this is somewhat better suited for graduate uh, uh, programs is because it requires students to put in a lot of work and not every undergraduate student is used to that you know your students you can uh, ask them to do a lot of work but uh, it is going to be a lot of work this is finally how you can uh, order and uh, learn some more as i said the uh, presentation slides are going to be available but you can find everything on our website uh, and uh, about all this information as well and uh, thank you very much for uh, listening through this and now your to your questions during your questions i'm gonna show you some excerpts for, from endorsements of which we are very proud and you can keep reading thank you very much and uh now to the questions okay so uh thanks for the questions i will i will start uh and i can see your questions in the chat box and please uh, carry on uh, providing them so let me start by uh, two questions that we got early on. The first was about how uh, to think about teaching this in, in a business program and how it's different to business statistics. So I think uh, the textbook is, is really suitable for a modern business statistics course. Uh, there is a great deal of overlap from uh, descriptive statistics and, and um, introductory regression work. Um, as well as discussion of how to think about problems. I think uh, one key point that you get here is, are the case studies and the completeness of the case studies and how whatever we do, you know, all the statistical methods are not just kind of hanging out there and, and are in artificial settings, but they are used to answer uh, practical questions. And I think that could be, uh, that could be very uh, appealing. The second question was how to, um, use this um, textbook in MS, in, in a master's in finance program. So, and, and how much coding uh, teaching it, it may need. So in terms of using this in a, in, a, in a master program for finance, I think we have done that at, at my university, at the Central European University uh, based in Vienna. We teach this uh, in finance programs, in graduate finance programs, and we teach the first half as, as core or almost core course, um, and because there are case studies that are of financial nature, that are on stock prices, we use more examples from those case studies, um, but other than that, it's it's pretty suitable. And in terms of coding, I think that if you wanna really understand what's going on with data analysis, you need to learn coding. Um, most people who work in finance use Python. That was one of the motivation for us to do the third language. Originally, the book was born with Stata and R, and we decided to create um, 
versions of code in Python, partly because of finance programs. Uh, people working in, in quantitative finance are, are more familiar with, uh, with Python. So uh, the one question was how, you, how we see these resources could improve the student learning experience, the main benefits. I think there are the two, the three main benefits are, one is that it, it, uh, it makes them uh, appreciate from day one on that data analysis is a process that you have, and you have to understand each and every element of that in order to produce data analysis, in order to do data analysis. And we give them help to acquire each element. Maybe they're, they're gonna need more, maybe there's too much in there, but at least but what is for sure is that we emphasize that, that, that a lot of things are needed. The second is that we try to explain things in plain English as well as in math, which makes the book a bit uh, uh, difficult to read because we are, we are, we think precise interpretation of results is, for example, important. Then we write them, write, write those sentences down. And then, and that's, that's kind of, I think, uh, that's, uh, that, that can help uh, students appreciate what their methods actually show with their data. And, uh, and of course, the code, coding itself, I think, uh, this, uh, this can the fact that they can actually learn coding on their own or if they learn coding uh, in some environment actual examples make coding more fun if you have to work on your own project that makes coding more important so there's pressure on you so you you learn more. Uh, so these are the main benefits i believe and uh one question is about any advice for adapting the, the textbook to teach remotely? Well, remote teaching, such as like these remote interactions, are obviously not great. But one thing that I I I, I hope our our book and the X system can achieve is to shift some parts of 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 one-sided lecturing into the book. So a student can read on that. There are some parts of the book that are not might not be fun to teach for some instructors. For example, data wrangling, but you can assign that to for students to read. And when you teach remotely, I think it's especially important that things that are that your many of your students or you yourself find boring, they should take as little time as possible. Otherwise, you will just lose lose everybody. So. Where, while on the other hand, working uh, with code remotely with many students, sharing screens, making them run their own code while you are running your own code, that can be done. So that's actually, that's a, that can actually be fun. Um, and there was a one, yeah, there was one question about uh, uh, undergraduate level. I just, I can only repeat that uh, technical knowledge is not, is, is very, I mean, undergrads can, can understand, should be able to understand everything from a technical st standpoint, but it's a lot of work. Yeah, let me, um, let me add to the undergrad um, question. I think uh, one difference I would, I would suggest for undergrad programs um, is basically to spread it out over two years. So wow. this book is suitable in a graduate program to run um, in an academic year, including additional coding courses that you may have. In an undergrad setting, that would potentially be two years. And um, and but other than that, uh, if you think it would be suitable, one of you was one of you were nice enough to to say that this new book. Let me just read that because it sounds so nice. So this new book is what I was hoping to find in teaching econometrics. It bridges the gap between typical business and economic stat courses and undergrad econometrics courses. And I think that was partly our aim as well to bridge different parts of teaching data stuff that includes data science and this is why you know we thought that modern machine learning is important to bring in um, introductory statistics um, and keep and focus especially on the parts that you will need later on and spend very little time on parts of statistics that may not be important in most of um, the analytical work that people may do uh, data visualization right some a, a topic that is uh, Kind of not um, used heavily in most econometrics courses. However, they are really important um, 
in real life, right? You, in real life, very often we have to make charts and graphs and 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 we need to teach students uh, them as, as well. Um, and um, a final question I want to answer is just uh, is 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 a question about um, uh, Gretel, and so um, we started uh, teaching this course, I think six or seven years ago, like an early version of that, and we use Gretel exactly for the reason uh, that it was free or or very cheap. I think. Um, at these days, uh, say, uh, R or Python is a is a better option. R has a click and point uh, interface av available, uh, and um, and that could be that could be an option uh, to use. Uh, can I just can I just jump in here? Yeah, sure. Go ahead. So, yeah, I use Gretel as well, and and other uh, custom made uh, free software for some of my undergrad teaching. There are two issues here with, with those programs. One is that they rarely are suitable for cleaning data. They usually work fine when you have a tidy, nice work file, and all you need to do is uh, estimate models or, or stuff like that. When you have to merge different data sets, do entity resolution or stuff like that, that, that can even sometimes, you know, creating new variables or sorting your data, that can be cumbersome in those. And the other thing is we wanted we focus on Stata R and Python is because that's what that's what people actually use in their work. So our experience is that students appreciate the opportunity to learn this together with their methods learning, because that gives them additional uh, incentive or pressure, if you want, to get familiarized with R most often instead of in, in a standalone course or, or after we are done with their coursework. Uh, one more question was, uh, uh, how the students helped? Well, the students helped us. Thank you very much for that question. Many, many people helped us along the way. Uh, many as a, as a publisher, many of our colleagues, some many colleagues that we haven't met in person, in fact, received uh, not only Anonymous reviews in, in earlier uh, uh, states of, of the of the production process, but also comments from here and there, and also endorsements. So I have to thank um, all of the profession and and and, but also all of our students. Students, some of our students helped in uh, uh, checking our code, uh, and uh, and uh, also some worked on trying to to help us in developing new case studies. Uh, some helped us proofreading the book, but the most important help that they provided is their is their feedback throughout the process. Not only this textbook, but also our teaching. What is it that they missed from us? Of course, we usually field a uh, a short survey at the end of our courses, in which they also uh, oh, those who do, and we also try to talk to them uh, in person. What is it that they miss? What is it that they like most? What is it? That, and not only those. Not only right after the course, but also when they are in their dissertation phases, for example, like in a master's thesis. So, what is it that they wish they learned in in a course? And all that feedback we try to incorporate. So, they without the students and also without the, the help of, of of our colleagues, we would not be here. And uh, that's also an, an answer to the question of how our teaching experience is reflected in the way the book is written. It's not. It's in a, in a sense, it's easier to teach formulae and derivations, but from a student's viewpoint, that's actually the easiest for them to do themselves as well. But you know, interpreting results or even thinking what to do is more difficult. Uh, is, is, a, is a different kind of question. It, it might be more difficult to teach. And maybe uncharacteristically for a textbook, we did put in advice like should you use linear probability or logit or probit what's the difference is there any for what purpose or is random forest better than boosting or what does it mean if boosting gives you better prediction with some uh, tuning parameters but what then 
I think the reason these things are in our textbook is because this is the, these are the things that students uh, kept asking us. So we try to make everything in the we make, put all, all things in the textbook that would be suited for individual learning uh, as as well. I think I answered we answered all the questions. If not, please let us yeah. know. So there is there is one more. Um, so um, challenges of of teaching data analysis in in areas like business. I think uh, that certainly is a large challenge because there are many people who are um, interested in uh, kind of just using methods rather than just fully understanding them. I think we circumvent that problem by trying to come up with interesting case studies and the case studies drive their students' interest into understanding more about methods and see how they differ and how they can be useful. And, and the other is um, to always kind of talk about the research question or the business question and the answer and how whatever they have done, how that resonates with the decision making. Right? We all try to do all our case studies relate to a decision making uh, situation right and and that's true even if you are in business and that's of course true also in, in public policy that you want to make a decision you want to decide if you should buy a product or not or underpriced if a product is underpriced or not or how and what to expect from a merger of airlines um, in terms of price reaction and 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 these questions are often you know interesting enough to drive students engagement um, and the other is we try to relegate some of the heavier parts of material in an under the hood section where people who are more interested can look up. So how is this exactly related to that and kind of investigate uh, more, more, of the, more of the nuances and make sure that the key methods are kind of hammered uh, strongly, um, strongly enough. Uh, two more questions. One, I, one that was uh, actually sent to us uh, ahead of time whether and how uh, health econ or health more likely public health or health policy programs can use our textbook i think all the methods here are applicable to public health and health policy programs i i myself had uh, public health students in my then applied econometrics course here at michigan and they they appreciated it very much uh with two caveats there are many business case studies here that health students may or may not appreciate. That's, but there are very many, there are quite a few health related case studies. So maybe instructors can uh, choose only a subset of the case studies. But the other thing is uh, some of the health, uh, the empirical health literature uses language that some of it is not, not in our textbook, it's somewhat different, but the methods themselves are. Are there. So I, I, if honestly, if I were an instructor in a health policy program or a public health program, I would still use this textbook. I would use this textbook together with a with a more traditional health statistics uh, textbook to combine the language with the insights that we provide and with the case studies that we provide. There's another question about uh, how we think this textbook stands out. Well. Uh, this might actually be a, a good final question to answer. Well, I think it stands out in in many ways. I hope that uh, that our some of the endorsements that are here uh, testify to to other people. And let me turn over to Gabor uh, Bekish for final comments. Yeah, so I think our our book, you know, what what our aim really was here is to provide a curated content, you know, that captures most of the aspect of what modern day data analysis need to know, and you know that that is why we have you know a variety of topics, and I think that that's certainly something that that makes this book stand out is the combination of these these topics and by by trying to give this experience where students go through the case studies and learn how to code and 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 learn how to create data visualizations we prepare them for any kind of job in life right and when when, when students are in certain program programs it does not necessarily mean that they would go 
to be a you know a public policy expert or will go on to do business right they may go in different ways and and we try to, to give them a set of tools and and capacities that they can learn in many many fields and i think that is the key strength of the book is preparing students for an active life as a data analyst data analyst who you know may do different parts in in their career but but these methods and these skills will be useful uh, whatever they do and i think that could be like a, a nice way to to finish this webinar and if you have any any further questions feel free to email us to email the organizers and we are happy to to answer we are on facebook and twitter so you can follow us there and ask questions and engage uh, with us as well thanks a lot thank you very much we appreciate that you follow us thank you